by giving those people those opportunities, it actually does better our lives because we all learn a lot through that process of genuinely connecting with them one-on-one. You're listening to the She Renovates podcast. You're listening to She Renovates, the podcast for women who want to renovate to create an income and a life they love. I want to welcome Danielle Chill today. Danielle and I have been friends for many years. And um, so Danielle has a business and I'll let her explain it to you because although I know a lot about the business, I always get the formal explanation wrong. But just to say that the mechanics of her business are based in Southern India and I have actually visited her workplace and met her employees. And that's how what we're about to talk about has really come about. So just to preface this by saying, I was feeling like I wanted to do something like in terms of beyond our business that benefited women who are not as fortunate as we are in Australia. And like anyone that's born in this country is a thousand times better off than someone that's born in the developing world. And so that's, I guess, what I'm, you know, the thing that I, that underpins what we're about to talk about. And I had want, I've been looking around for somewhere where we could contribute in order to make a difference. And Danielle and I have had this conversation numerous times. And this particular day, the penny dropped. And, and so, and so now we have a partnership of sorts where we are able to contribute in a small way to the future of the women that work with Danielle. And so welcome, Danielle. Hi, Bernadette, and thank you very much. Yeah, so I, as I mentioned before, this is just a brief little episode because I have asked you to come and speak at She Renovates live stream at 2021. What I wanted to do was give them a bit of a taste of what they're going to be hearing and seeing at the event. And so because you will be sharing that particular project, I'd love you to share just briefly what's happening. Uh, sure. What's happening with me in India? Is that the, the thing? Um, I, I guess before I start on that, what I would say to the listener is one of the things that I guess has kept Bernadette and I connected through the years, we, we originally met at a business networking group. But one of the things that's kept us connected during the years is that both of us have this desire to help other women. We both help them in very different ways. On one hand, Bernadette helps them become financially independent and helps them on that journey through renovating and her specialty is houses and she lives the role model of financial independence herself. I too am a very independent woman and I have decided that it was sort of became my life's mission after I met these ladies to help them become independent women just like you and I. So even though Bernadette and my role of mentoring women to independence has that in common, that independence, both of us have gone through down very different paths to achieve a similar result. So the reason that I wanted to start with that is so that you, the listener, can connect why Bernadette, who specializes in house renovating, has Danielle, who on one hand specializes in hand knitting, has these connected on the podcast, because both of us have a much higher mission. And yep. that is to get the women who are surrounded by us to be totally independent. Mine is independence of thought and financial independence comes second. 
whereas Bernadette is independent of finances and underlying that is the house renovation. So here we are, two independent women who have gone down that life's path. So that's how this friendship has stayed connected during the years. And as Bernadette mentioned to you, I um, work and I own a business in Southern India. I actually own two businesses, one here in Australia and one in Southern India. And the one in Southern India started um, because I had a fashion retail store here and it specialized in hand knitting. I was just a little girl, this was many decades ago now, who thought it was a great idea to have Australian wool, Australian designs and Australian hand knit here in Australia, that I thought the world would want that. I was always ambitious. I've always lived on a global scale, sorry, a global um, stage but I just thought that that would work. And it wasn't meant to be because under the Gillard government, the legislation changed and made it not legal to employ casual workers in the fashion industry in Australia. So I had to look somewhere else. And that's how this voyage to India started because I've always been a very lucky girl in life and this time was no different. And someone introduced me to someone who said, Danielle, there are hand knitters in India, because I'd been looking in other countries, New Zealand, America, Vietnam, wherever. And I flew over, met this person. His name was Nick Potts. And the reason that I'm proud to mention his name is subsequently he has died, but he's had a vast influence on my life. And I flew over and he introduced me to the first 10 ladies who could knit at that time for my brand. But there was something quite magical um, about that connection. And I'm sure all the listeners know that feeling. You, you know, you can be at a party here, you can go to McDonald's, you can go to sophisticated dinner, you can go to Coles and feel connected to the person who's serving you. We all know that feeling of what it feels like when you meet somebody and there's something about the way your eyes lock that you feel connected to that person. And that was me to these ladies. They took my hands, they looked in my eyes and took me around their villages. And that's how the love fest for me started. It wasn't always a love fest. This is India. I have a love-hate relationship with it. But it went from, you know, a little bit of love and a lot of hate to a lot of love and a little bit of hate. Um, but that's sort of part of the journey. And that was my attraction there. And on the plane on the way home, what went on for me is these ladies are amazing and I could give a real lot of them work. I have to work really hard and grow my brand really big and sell a lot of garments. And by the time 24 hours later that I arrived back in my own home door in Sydney in Australia, I walked in the door and thought, more, more fool am I. I can't employ a lot of people if I'm only knitting for my brand. So I had to close down my brand. Brand. It wasn't a big decision. So when I say I had to, it was just a pleasure just to close that part of the door and knit for lots of brands. And that way we could transform lots of lives in Southern India. So that's really how I got entrenched in India. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting story because you had been going to and from India for a few years before you decided, I decided to go with you on one of those trips. And when, when we went, I was just completely gobsmacked because I don't know what I was expecting, but when I saw how you were working and the conditions that you were living in and working in and not like, yeah, just really, you know, where you used to stay, like you slept in a room on your own up on the top floor of a house. And I, it was just, I don't know, it looked really scary to me and I was really impressed to be honest. And <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. It's just really funny. A lot of people say that, but I guess in hindsight or now I've never known fear. I was fearless. It never that had never entered my head. It was like I was on a mission and this is what I had to do and this is what I had to do to achieve it. 
And that that was Eddie and Chevity, which doesn't it have some reputation for being an incredibly violent village? It does. I try not to talk about it because I don't go there in my own daily life of all the bad things that can happen in the world. Um, but out of all the local villages around there, that particular one does have a reputation for, mm. shall I put it right out there, murders and things like that. But I just never feared for my life and I always felt very safe because these women, women, when I first met them, they wouldn't let me walk down the street with out five of them on one hand and five of them on the other hand. So I knew from the very beginning that nothing would happen to me. It never entered my head and it still never has. That um, It's grown into a big love fest really between the ladies and I that they would walk on hot coals for me. And Bernadette will tell you I've moved mountains for them. So it's um, the same way either way. It's a give-give, you know, win-win. Yeah. And so... Um... So I'm hoping, well, I'm expecting that in the, at the event you'll be sharing some images and so we can really get a sense um, through pictures. Um, but for now, we'll just talk about it. And so um, the, our, our arrangement was a result of how COVID impacted your business and also around your philosophies about charity and so on so do you want to talk a little bit about that yes i will and but before i start that bernadette i just like to talk about this whole notion of independence that no matter what i've done um it's always been underridden by the fact that i think it's really important for well anybody in the world really regardless of gender but because i'm a female i've stood for female independence because that's what I've done my whole life and working with these ladies, independence, having a voice, having somebody take notice of them and having developing their brains to allow them to think is always underpinning absolutely everything I do. Now, the reason that I'm sharing that is because when I met these ladies, typical of women in developing countries who live in India, but certainly pertinent, very pertinent to these village women who live in the south of India. They're raised by two parents. There's no such thing as divorce. Um, some of them have a one-parent family if one parent met with an accident, but the majority of them are raised by two parents. And the way that they are raised is very culturally strong and that is to be incredibly compliant. So you must do what your parents want you to do at all times. And if you don't, either verbally or physically, it's made very clear to you that this is what will happen to you if you do not comply. So they were raised to be very, very compliant and the listener won't be surprised to know that then the ladies have arranged marriages, so they have no independence of thought in that as well. And then once they're, and excuse the expression, under their husband's thumb, uh, they have no uh, independence or very little independence of thought then. So coming to work was the first time that these ladies could have independence of thought. and. I always realized that if you've never been to school, you are missing intellectual input. And you and I know just uh, without me having to articulate this, that if you're missing intellectual input, it doesn't make you dumb by any stretch of the image, imagination. It just means you haven't had information inputted into you. But along my journey, I've also realized that going to school teaches you many other skills other than intellect and making decisions is one of them. So this independence is very strong in my business. So from the day I met these ladies, even though I couldn't speak Tamil, they had to think. Their first thought was, would you like to come and learn to hand it? And that's a decision, yes or no. Once they joined our company, same or different, yes or no. So they had to make black and white decisions from the day that I met them. And the reason that I'm telling this story about 
how important independence is to me is underpinning the partnership that Bernadette School of Renovating and I have come to um, enjoy now in that she kindly and the School of Renovating kindly gives mobile phones for every one of you that joins um, to the ladies and that increases their sense of independence that what happens is happened was during COVID, the ladies couldn't leave their house, some of them, and we definitely could not travel between villages. Now, this meant that a lot of ladies couldn't come to work, so they lost their independence. They lost their income and their intellectual independence. And so by having a smartphone, it's not for their personal use to phone up their friends and have a chat. The smartphones stay in their place of work. But by having a smartphone, it allows them to stay independent and allows them to continue to work. And because we're a social enterprise and the business basically was almost lost at the beginning of COVID, we didn't have the cash or unlike normal businesses where they go out and take out a loan to grow, because we're a social enterprise, we weren't eligible for any of those. So we reached out to a business of which the School of Renovating and Bernadette's business decided that we had equal values to continue supporting these women to be independent. So that's how the partnerships came about and that's how the phones got to be valuable. Um, and that's what we do with the phones. So this um, notion of independence for women underpins absolutely everything that we do. That's, um, that's great. Um, Danielle and yeah I think we might not I don't think we're going to divulge too much more now because we want to keep some of the the joy for the event but we do have another little project in the offing in terms of the women and Ooh. yes well it was your idea <laughs> The next chapter in this story, and that's around Airbnb. So you mentioned to me that that the women would benefit from learning how to list a room. The women would just relish all sorts of financial independence. You know, we've given them um, an education. We've taught them to read. We've taught them intellectual independence. And whilst if every female is employed in a village, it certainly increases the financial cycle and the economics of that particular village. Um, these women, before I came into their lives, already had massive loans and their husbands take out loans that they can drink. And so by partnering with Bernadette, we've actually, you know, by her hinting and you know, her reading my mind and her and I have discussed this, we'd like to take the level of financial independence to the women to the next level. And that's what um, this partnership will do. Yeah. It, it really surprised me because I thought, you know, like here, um, Airbnb is a bit of a basket case in lots of areas because of COVID. And I was expecting the same in India, but it's not the case. Uh, well, India... Well, in my area of India, it has gone through phases of being locked down, mm -hmm. um, but right now it's not. So travel within India is massive, huge right now, huge, because the Indians like us can't leave their country. So domestic travel is enormous. So the demand on that area has never been higher. And the accommodation is expensive. Well, it's out of proportion of what it should be in the middle of a rural village because it's a fabulous area and there's so many things to see around there. It's a very interesting area. And uh, the thing agree. about India um, that I don't know if the listeners know, but it wasn't so many years ago that, um, well, let's put it this way, every state in India has its own cultural heritage and speaks its own language that it's only comparatively recently that English links all the states. Um, so all states have a very rich heritage. 
but the Tamil language particularly is one of the oldest languages in India. So it has a very, very, very rich culture. Plus it's on a coastline. So it has a fabulous, um, yeah, fabulous weather, fabulous scenery. I mean, I really particularly love that area. And there's some amazing hotels there that serve delicious food. Um, but that aside, um, that, that's what the appeal is of that area. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, that's... Um... You know, I would like to talk a lot more about it, but we're going to save the best bits for the event. And just to say um, thank you for agreeing to come and share your story today and in December. I think we've given everyone a little bit of a taste of what to expect. And I love the fact that we're able to look outward and um, rather than just be thinking about how can we better ourselves and our lives, um, how can we do that for someone who doesn't have the same opportunities that we do? Thank you. And Bernadette, let me be quite forthright here. And by giving those people those opportunities, it actually does better our lives because Absolutely. we all learn a lot through that process of genuinely connecting with them one-on-one. -on -one. Exactly. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's it for today. Hi Bernadette, it's Ali in Canberra. Hi Bernadette, my name's Charlie. Hi Bernadette, it's Liz here. Hi Bernadette, this is James from Bondi in Sydney. I've got a question I'd like to ask. I have a question. I just have a question for you. Interested to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for the show. Love it. Hi Bernadette. Lucy here. Um, I'm just wondering if you can give me some advice regarding planning permits. So I've recently purchased a property uh, in Victoria that has a um, heritage overlay on the street. Um, now I do need to replace the front and back door and the existing windows and I need to remove the shed and I want to build a deck in the backyard. So all of this requires a planning permit. Um, I also want to subdivide the block. So, uh, in subdividing the block, I will need to submit a planning permit to the council as well. Um, especially, particularly when it comes time to build. My question for you is, should I wait and do one planning permit for the whole project, which would mean a delay in replacing the doors and, um, building the deck and removing the shed or should I get two planning permits, one for the existing property and get it done and up to scratch earlier and take my time uh, doing the back and um, getting a separate planning permit for the back block? So I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Hi, Lucy. Um, thanks for your question and congratulations on your project. So, um, Firstly, uh, I would suggest you talk to council about the process, but I'm certain that, uh, that it's, it's going to be two separate applications anyhow, because in one you're talking about a subdivision and in the other you're talking about changes to an existing property. Um, so I would go and get the planning permit for the changes to the house as soon as you can. The second reason why I think that makes sense is then you can get that renovation done, complete, and have that property earning an income while you're getting the approval for the subdivision. And so it makes financial sense as well. So you've got an income coming in rather than waiting until you've got it all ready to go. Uh, I hope that helps. If you want to meet up with a group of savvy renovating, I shouldn't say it's all women because it's not, but savvy renovators, I'll say, come over and join She Renovates. It's completely it's free Facebook group and it is growing at the rate of knots. We hit a thousand members just recently and now it seems to have picked up momentum. And so they are all savvy renovating women and men that are working their little hearts out to live a better life through renovating. Join if you're not already a member and then ask, comment and do whatever you would like to do in order to further your renovation journey. And that's it for me today. So I'll see you next week. 
This is the She Renovates podcast. To discover how to harness the power of renovating, check out theschoolofrenovating.com.